Oh. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see good to see everybody in church. It's good to be in church. It's good to uh, good to have some fellowship around God's word. That's uh, it sure is a blessing. Um, it's a privilege that we're even holding this book in our hands, and we could seek so much from it. Like I said, this this is a treasure mine, and uh, we're going to be mining for a lot of a lot of treasures this morning. I got a lot of verses to go through. Um, so if you would. Uh, Let's, uh, let's all stand up for these reading of these two passages. Let's give some respect to the Word of God here this morning. Let's just all stand up for the reading of these two passages. I'm going to go turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you've got a handout, what we're talking about, we're talking about the mysteries of God. Okay? Now, if you've got a Bible in the pew, that's page number... Let's see here. That's page number 1529. Page 1529, if you've got a... Uh, Bible in the pew, um, fifteen twenty nine, First Corinthians chapter fifteen, and then we'll start at verse fifty. But like I said here, real quick, we're studying the mysteries of God. Okay, and we left off, you know, on, on uh, I think it's First Corinthians chapter four, where the Bible says we're to be stewards of the mysteries of God. We're entrusted with these mysteries, and and, and God says it's a requirement that in stewards that a man be found faithful. So if God says that I'm required to do something, I'm required to be entrusted with these mysteries, then you better believe I want to know what these mysteries are that I'm entrusted with. So that that the Bible says that we may be able to teach others so that they may be able to teach others. So we're studying the mysteries of God. All those are listed on a handout. Um, So we're on mystery number five. And this is the mystery of the rapture. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting at verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. You can't get to heaven in this body that you're in right now. This thing's corrupted. It can't inherit the kingdom of God. You can't go up into heaven in this sinful flesh that we're in. Something has to happen to this body. Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. You say, well, why do we call this the, the, the mysteries? You know, we're studying the seven mysteries. Because the Bible says, every time that we're studying these mysteries, this is a mystery. You know, great is the mystery of godliness, the mystery that Christ is in you, the hope of glory, the mystery that we are a part of Jesus Christ. We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And like I said, these are, these are mysteries that we can't, you know, in, in explain intellectually. I can't give you some, you know, special mathematical formula to figure this thing out. It's something that God says. And I believe it. Okay, we, we got to settle it at that. So Paul says, look, I behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And it says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. All right, we can keep going on. We'll probably, uh, probably read the, the passage later on in the, in the study, but that's a passage on the rapture. The dead in Christ rise, then we which are alive remain, we get changed, okay? This corruptible, this corruptible that we're in, this body that we're in, it's going to be changed, okay? In a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump. You'd be surprised how many Christians interpret that. Well, see, Donald Trump was in the office. You know, he's the, la- he's the last Trump, okay? Trump was in the office, last Trump. You never know, that might have some type of connection. You know, the rapture could be soon. No doubt, I believe the rapture is soon, but, uh, you know, the, at the last Trump. What an interesting play on words that God did give us a president named Trump. And at the last Trump, <laughs> this event, you know, could, could occur. Uh, I- interesting. Anyways, look at, look at uh, the next passage on this, and then you can be seated. Come to uh, 1 Thessalonians. That's page number... Um, if you've got a Bible in the pew, that's page 1574. Page 1574. All right, page 1574. This is the book of 1 Thessalonians. We actually studied this book way back last year. Okay, you know, we're... We're doing a verse-by-verse Bible study. We're only in the book of 1 Corinthians. So we spent a year, pretty much, studying three books of the Bible, verse-by-verse, line-upon-line. That's the greatest way to learn the Bible, is you've got to go through this thing verse-by-verse, and there's so much that you can dig out of these verses here. 
And uh, we studied Thessalonians a long time ago, but this is a blessing. A great passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse 13. Verse 13 through 18. Verse 13 says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Paul says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant. That's one of the, that's one of the big uh, clauses that Paul always uses. Remember he used that clause last week about the mystery and the blindness of Israel? Look, I would not have you to be ignorant that blindness happened to Israel and things. Paul says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant. And that's one of the things I say over and over again. But when I got saved and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, one of the first prayers that I remember saying to God is, Lord, help me not be an ignorant Christian. Help me not be an ignorant Christian. I want to know, Lord, I got a heart for truth. I want to know the truth. This guy says one thing. This guy says another thing. This denomination says one thing. We all ought not to be ignorant Christians. All right? We have to grow in grace and grow in knowledge of God's Word. Paul says this to the Thessalonians. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He's, he's going to inform them. All right? Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. we got no point. If we know that somebody, you know, uh, was saved, they trusted in Jesus Christ, and they die, we shouldn't sorrow like the rest of the world sorrows because they don't got no hope. We have the hope of the afterlife because the Bible tells us so, Jesus Christ told us so, so we, we don't got to get all worked up. No doubt we're going to weep, we're going to mourn, we lose a loved one. Yeah, that's tragic. But if they're saved and they trusted in Christ, they're up in glory, man. They got it better off than, than we do down here, really. So look what it says, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. We sung about the, that early this morning, you know. Be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I like verse number 18. This is a good passage. Look what it says, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is a comforting hope. Um, Brother Jordan, would you lead us off just a quick blessing on the message, and then we could be seated. Thanks, Lord. We put him up there for a reason. He's preaching for a reason, Lord. We just ask that he may show us something out of your word. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated now. All right, so just for a quick intro here, okay? <clears throat> Number one, this is by far the most climatic event that's going to happen in the yet future, okay? If you study the Bible, you know one of the biggest worldwide tragic climatic event, whatever you want to call it, is the flood of Noah. What did God do? He sent a global flood. This wasn't no localized flood that we see. You know, we still get floods. And every time you look up at a rainbow, it's a, prom it's a, it's a token, it's a covenant, it's a promise that God will never flood the world again. Well, you say, well, what do you mean? There's floods over there in India and in Indonesia. There's tsunamis over here. It was a global flood. That was God's judgment. That was God's wrath poured upon planet Earth. The whole entire world was overtaken at this. That was way back, uh, back here in, the, in, in Noah's time. Um, no doubt, the next climatic point on God's calendar is the rapture, okay? Um, now, the rapture, i got to just do a brief topic, a uh, brief, you know, study here on what you see here on the board. These are what, what you call Bible dispensations. Now, the word dis, uh, dispensation is, I think of it as something dispensing, okay, a dispenser. God dispenses truth to certain groups of people according to certain time periods. Dispensations, that word shows up in the Bible four times, we ought to know, you know, we have to understand what that is, dispensations. Now, it's interesting, all the protocols on how God worked throughout the various ages of history, you know, Adam, you know, God gave Adam and Eve one commandment, don't you dare touch that tree, don't you, don't you partake in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay? And, you know, they were walking with God, talking with God in the garden, it was in paradise, just him and his wife, and all the animals, was lovely, it was beautiful. Next thing you know what happened, they fell. They fell away from God. We studied this on Thursday. And what did they do? They partook in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That ended that dispensation where they were innocent. They were innocent. They had no idea what good and evil was until they partook of it. Then their eyes were open. Okay? So that ended that dispensation. And that dispensation ended in something tragic. 
they partook in the, in the tree. Okay, now look at us. We're a bunch of cursed people that needed redeemed from sin and things. Next thing you know, there gets into, uh, the, you know, uh, everybody, you know, now people have their eyes open, knowledge of good and evil. And you read in the book of Genesis why God flooded the world because the Bible says every thought of the imagination of their heart was only evil continually. People were wicked as can be and God had to flood the world. So that dispensation of, you know, um, wait, I forget what it's called um, uh, biblically. They call it the antediluvial dispensation, which is before the flood, okay? Now that dispensation ended with a climatic event. God had to pour out his wrath and flood planet Earth. Next thing you know, Noah and his eight people, his eight family members, they get, they're, they're parked up on the top of Mount Ararat. That's over there in Turkey. Next thing you know, they start, they start out again, start out fresh. And um, they start out, and this gets into the, the, the dispensation of human government. Okay, we need to govern people. There's so much people, we've got to govern them. This gets into the story of the Tower of Babel. The, the men try to work their way to heaven. They try to build this big tower, and God cuts that thing short. You know, I think of it, God, the project manager. He comes down, you know, people think, oh, look at us, Lord, we're trying to build this tower up into heaven. Aren't you pleased with us? The Lord said, uh-uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to confound the languages. That's how we got all these, lang these languages to this day. You speak Mandarin Chinese, he speaks Spanish, he speaks Italian, whatever. God confounded the languages. So that dispensation of human government, God says the whole world was at one, was one. And God had to split that thing. But the, uh, the climatic event there was they didn't finish their big project trying to climb up into heaven. Then this gets into a dispensation where God calls out Abraham. Okay, God calls out Abraham. He, he calls out a race of people, the Jewish people. We studied them last week. And uh, God gives them all these promises, these covenants. He says, I'm going to give you a land. And next thing you know, uh, somehow, some way, the Jewish people end up in slavery in Egypt for 430 years. Well, that didn't end too well. And it starts into, uh, you know, that, that was bad. 430 years. Then, then, what's, then what, uh, what, what happened after that? God, uh, God chose a guy named Moses to get the people out. Then Moses, <laughs> Moses got them under another dispensation of the law. The Ten Commandments. Moses went up into the mountain. God spoke with him and revealed the Ten Commandments. And God gave Moses Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He gave Moses the five books, the first five books of our Bible. And, uh, God, and now they're under the law. Okay, 613 statutes. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to wear certain things. Okay. Now, how did that dispensation end? The Bible says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believeth. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. You say, how do I get to heaven? I'm not trusting in my own righteousness. I'm trusting in God's righteousness. God had to come down, walk a perfect life, not, not mess up, not have one unclean thought, not, you know, not say, you know, he never had to say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. He was perfect. He was God, manifested in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He came down, he lived a perfect life that we may believe on him in what he did for us, you know, in, in all, you know, we can't work our way to heaven like the Tower of Babel. We can't do good works and, you know, oh, I, I, I donated this to charity and, oh, I, w I went to church for 50 years or I did this and I did that. You can't get up to heaven and boast. God set up the way of salvation where if you want to boast on something, you boast on what God did. Yeah, praise the Lord, I'm saved. But how, how do you know you're saved? Because I'm trusting in what God did for me. The gift of salvation. He died for my sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Okay. That's the gift. You can't add nothing to it. That's the gospel. That's good news. That's the word gospel means, okay? But when you look at it, how'd, how'd the end of the dispensation of the law, how'd that end? Well, that, I'd say that was a climatic event. It changed our whole calendar. We're living in, uh, what, 200, 2022 A.D.? A.D. You know, now they want to say, I don't know, after, after common era and before common era. Uh -uh. It's B.C., before Christ. Or A.D., and that means in Latin, annual, annual dominal. All that means is in the year of the Lord. And I like that. We sign contracts with loans or whatever, and you look at it, they still keep that saying. In the year, or our marriage, I think, our marriage license and all that, joined together in marriage, uh, you know, 2019 or 2020. Um, I'm sorry, babe. 2021, 20, I'm so bad with years. I, I, told, I told one guy i only been preaching for eight months one time. I'm like, wait a minute, I've been preaching for like a, almost a year now or something. I, sometimes I freeze up and stuff with numbers and things. But anyways, it says in the year 2022, in the year of our Lord. 
that's on legal contracts even. So, okay? So, Jesus Christ changed the whole entire calendar. Okay? We're in the year 2022 AD. Okay? Now, this enters into what's called the church age. Okay? That's why we're studying Paul's writings. Those, those uh, 13 books that are directly applicable to us today. Okay? You can get a lot of good things from the... From the I, like we studied that a couple weeks ago. You could read the whole Bible and get some good things out of it. No doubt. But Paul's writings are directly written for the church age, which is where we're living at right now. Okay? Now, if you know in the Bible, how does this, how does this age end? It ends in apostasy, which, which means it ends in a falling away. Something negative happens. It ends in a falling away. People fall away from the faith. Yeah, I believed one day, and next year I went out to college, and ah, forget about the Bible, forget about Jesus and all that. You're going to see that, and that's sad. I would to God, none of us sitting here would fall away from the faith. You know, Jude told us to earnestly contend for the faith, okay? Not to fall away and to compromise and tolerate. Yeah, you know, we're all the same. Or, well, there's many ways to heaven. And No, okay? You've you got to stand strong on what the Bible teaches. You've got to know the Bible. So this, this dispensation ends with a falling away. Next thing you know, the climatic event we're going to be studying is the rapture. This is a worldwide event where every single believer that trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that trusted He died for my sins, He was buried, rose again the third day, whether the, old, whether the saints that, that sleep, I mean, they're in the grave, uh, or we which are alive and remain, God's going to call out all those people. That's a climatic event. I mean, you, that's a worldwide event. You're going to see people in Pittsburgh. You're going to see people in down, down in the south. you see people in, all over the world, over in the Middle, Middle East, everywhere. When next thing you know, where did all these people just go? Where did, where did they, they just vanished away out of thin air? You know, and ancient aliens and stuff. They talk about, oh, we'll make these UFO movies where they get beamed up and sucked up and all that. The devil always mimics God. He always tries to throw dirt on it. They, they pump out all these Hollywood movies with the same theme embedded into it. Oh, alien invasion comes and they get sucked up and they get taken away. And what are we going to do? You know, Independence Day and all that. They made all kinds of movies on it. Next thing you know, once we get raptured out, we go up to the judgment seat of Christ. We get tried for our rewards. What did we do for the Lord after we got saved? Next thing you know, this enters into a time period known as the tribulation period or the time of Jacob's trouble. This is when literally the devil is rolling the world. There's going to be a one world government. They're all pushing this you know, right now. And listen, that's why you read the Old Testament. Because there was a one world government back in Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. God said the whole world's at one. One guy rolled it. His name was Nimrod. So next thing you know, you, that's why you got to read history. This thing repeats itself. And in this time period, over here, it's a one world government, one world currency system. You can't walk into a store unless if you got the market of beast. I can't go get groceries no more. You know, you're, we're seeing a bunch of foreshadows to this right now. Oh, you can't come into my business. You don't got the mask. What well, is going to come a point in time? You can't come into my store unless you got the mark. You know, what an interesting, what, stand six feet apart. Why not stand seven feet apart? The, the Bible says, be aware, you know, the mark of the beast is number 666. All these sixes around and stuff. The devil, the, 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 what is it, the old saying, the detail, the devil's in the details or something like that. You see how all this stuff is making sense. It's, it's leading up to this time period where people are going to, they're going to receive the devil as the world's savior. That's scary. They're going to, that's a, a delusion. Thank God us who are saved, we get caught out um, before this event. Next thing you know, we have the Battle of Armageddon. And most people, you think of Armageddon, they think right away, yeah, it was a Bruce Willis movie back when the comet was coming down and stuff. No, the Battle of Armageddon is a, is a battle of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back down to planet Earth to destroy Satan's kingdom and set up his 1,000-year reign. So this is important about Bible study. This is why I got all this stuff written up on the board. Is every verse in the Bible is talking to a, you know, you get all the verses in the right place, not one single verse in the Bible contradicts. That's why there's so much confusion. Well, you know, oh, oh, it says over here, you know, I can't eat meat. I can't eat shellfish. I can't eat pork. Now, all of a sudden, I come over to here, and Paul's saying, every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused. So what do you do with that? You say, I'll throw away the Bible. It's an error. It's a, it's a mistake. No, no. The Bible, you got to say, it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A work beneath not to be ashamed. It says, rightly dividing the word of truth. you got to rightly divide this Bible and say, yeah, that's talking. This time period, those verses that are talking about way out here, 
God creates a new heaven and a new earth where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, all comfort. What are you going to do? Try to apply those verses right now? <laughs> what do you mean? We still cry. We still have pain. We still got cancers. We still got diseases. So you've got to watch out when trying to apply every verse in the Bible and squeezing it into where we're at right now. That's why we're studying Paul's writings. Everything that Paul wrote is applicable to us. All right, that was the introduction. Okay, now, um, what we uh, talked about briefly about, you know, this, the, uh, it's also more script, what we should call this event is called the catching away, the catching away of the body of Christ. It's more commonly heard of as the rapture. Okay, uh, a Greek word for it is um, harpazo. That's how they, they took this harpazo in the King James translators. It was translated as catching away. Now, harpazo, that's an interesting word. That's where we get the word harpoon. You know, harpoon fishing, I think, right away. You know, it's like at this spear, and got that string attached to it, and you spear a fish or whale or shark, whatever you're out there fishing for, and you pull that rope and you catch them fish back. Well, it's interesting. That's kind of like what God's going to do with the rapture. Remember what Jesus said to, to the men? You know, you know, and who did he come to? He came to Peter. He came to a bunch of fishermen and said, Peter, you're going to be a fisher of men one day. So it's interesting, a little play that God likens men unto fish. You're going to catch a lot of, you're going to catch men one day. You're going to get them saved. You're going to bring them back to the knowledge of me. Fishers of men. So it's almost like at the rapture, the, you know, God almost like harpoons his people, catches them in a big net and draws them out. He draws them out of the world, okay? It's even more fascinating. You get into a deeper study on the Bible. There's a sea of glass, there's water that parts eternity. You get into the study of the universe. The scientists, they're looking for, they're looking for water and stuff, little drops of water on Mars and things like that. Well, if you read the Bible, you could save billions of dollars. The Bible says there's water out there in the, in the universe. Why don't you just believe the Bible? You know, go get that, go use that money to go drill some wells or build some villages or something in third world countries. What do you, you know, the Bible says there's a sea of glass. It's like it's frozen that contains our universe. You know, we're living in a contained, oh, people say, oh he did it a cult symbol. <laughs> Please forgive me. Anyways, um, we live in a contained universe, okay? And it's, it's contained by water. It's fascinating. So it's almost like God throws the spear, he catches down, he grabs his people through the water, the sea of glass, snatches them back up. And that sea somehow has to part. It has to part. He comes down and snatches it up. That's why you read the Bible, you see all these foreshadows. Moses, the deliverer, parting the, part the Red Sea to get the people safe, you know, to get the people safe into the promised land. Well, Jesus is going to do a similar thing. He's going to part the sea of the universe, come right down through that like, a, like he's harpoon fishing and snatch out everybody that believes in him. And if you read the book of Moses and stuff, what they were saying, who was out there chasing Moses and the Israelites? Pharaoh. He was on a horse and chariot thinking, I'm going to, imagine that, you're in, a, in the, the, that Red Sea and you see walls of water and you see dry ground are walking through this thing. And next thing you know, uh, the, you know, the Israelites, they're running away and they look back and they see Pharaoh on his chariot. He's whipping his horses and stuff, and he's chasing these people through the water. What did God do to Pharaoh? He swallowed, he closed that, closed that thing, and they all died, you know? Now, there's a lot of pictures. I think it's interesting. But if that be at the rapture, God calls us up, and you see the devil. The devil, the Pharaoh is likened unto the devil in the Bible, and you see the devil, that great red dragon, chasing us through outer space. Next, you know, God closes the, red, closes the sea of glass, whatever, on him. So I think it's some interesting pictures. That may not be... Uh, 100% scriptural, but I think it makes some, for some good preaching. Um, it, it's interesting thoughts. So anyways, we're going to be studying for the next probably two weeks. Who is the rapture for? When does this event occur? The wrath of God. How does this event happen? The groups of people in this event. The order of it. What will our bodies be like? It's always an interesting topic. What, what are our bodies going to be like? What do we, you know, that, people always ask questions on that. Uh, what are our bodies going to be like? The sounds and atmosphere of this event. What's it going to sound like? What's the atmosphere going to be like and stuff? What will we leave behind? And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So listen, I really don't want to rush this teaching, but we'll, first off, we're going to get to the first point. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now number one, who is this, who is this event for? Who is the rapture for? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Okay. Paul says, I would not you be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. 
Now, first off, I have to cover that because the word sleep in the Bible is used in, in a couple different ways. There's a, a regular sleep. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm knocked out. I got to go to bed. I need a rest. That's one type of sleep. And then there's a, the, uh, death. Death is likened unto sleep. And then there's uh, like a spiritual sleep. People, they're, they're asleep. They're sleeping. They don't know the things of God. They're like their eyes are shut. They don't know what's going on around us. They're asleep. You know, so there's three ways that word's used here. And in this sense here, it's used as they die. And I like what Jesus said, you know, with the story of Lazarus. Um, you know, Jesus says, for Lazarus, he, he sleepeth, he sleepeth. And his disciples said, well, if Lazarus is sleeping, then he's going to do well. He's going to be okay. And Jesus said, and then said the next verse, Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> so he said, look, if you didn't get what I was saying here about he was sleeping, you know, they said, oh, you know, they, they, they mix it up. And Jesus said, look, he's dead. Okay, so sleep in the Bible is likened unto death also, okay? So concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, I like verse 14 because this is the prerequisite of going at this event. People get ask me a lot, well, well, I'm scared. I don't want to get left behind. Well, what do I do that I get taken up with God? Well, here's the prerequisite right here. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. That's even the dead people, all the dead saints right now that, are, that believe Jesus died for their sins and was buried, resurrected the third day, rose again. They're going to get, they're going to get caught up out of their graves. Now, I can't help but think, you know, that's why it's important reading the Old Testament. You look at the guy, you look at the story of Joseph. Okay, Joseph. He was sold into Egypt by his brethren and all that. If you look at Joseph, you know what it says about him? Not a bone of Joseph was left in Egypt. Not a bone was left of Joseph in Egypt. Okay? Um, not to get too heavy or nothing, but you study the characteristics of Joseph in the Old Testament. You're going, to look, you're going to look, and then you study the life of Jesus Christ, a lot of the characteristics are the same. And you look at Jesus Christ, um, not a bone of Jesus Christ was left on this world. Not a bone of it. You know, it, you, you know it, they, not even a fingernail of him, not even a piece of hair, nothing. He was gone. And Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world. We're to leave the world. We're not to be part of the world. We're not to go back to the customs and traditions of Egypt. Egypt's like none of the world. We hang on to these customs and you know, you hear the term worldly Christians and all they're consumed and infatuated with is the world, the world. No, no. We're told, we're told to be separate from the world, okay? Um, and it's interesting, not a bone of our bodies. If we die, I don't want to die. I pray that we get taken up out, you know, alive and remain. But not a bone of every, any Christian on this world, not a molecule is going to be left on this planet. So there's a lot of cool things in the Bible that's pictures and typology, it's called. Um, not a bone, if we die, not a bone of us is going to be left here on this planet. Even so them which sleep in Jesus, verse 14, will God bring with them. Verse 15, um, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now here's the other group of people, okay, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Prevent, that's a way of saying pre-event. Okay, so the, the way that this event works, it's the dead rise first, then we which are alive and remain get caught up together. Okay, um, so pre-event, it pre-events, them which are asleep. Okay, that's just how that works out. So there's the two groups of people um, in this event. The dead in Christ, and then we which are alive and remain. Now, it's interesting. This is why I spent weeks on covering these mysteries because the last couple of weeks we should be familiar with being in Christ, in the body of Christ. You know, once you're in the body of Christ, you're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. When God comes back and catches his people away, it's only those who are in the body of Christ. You know, that's how all these mysteries kind of go hand in hand when, when, when we think of it, okay? Um, so those that are in Christ. Now, real quick, just a, a quick thing about when you die... And if you're saved, your body stays down in the grave. Your soul and spirit, Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yeah, okay, I understand that. So, okay, my, my, remember, man is a body, soul, and spirit. If I die right now, fall over on a break right behind his pulpit or whatever, I die, you're going to have to end up burying me. But my soul and spirit are instantly up in eternity 
with God, but my body's down here still. So the point of this, this event is God takes that old corpse, okay, and gives it an incorruptible body. You know, and you say, well, explain that. I, I can't explain that. It's God. That's what he's going to do, okay? You know, think about it. Well, what about all the, they say, well, what about all those people that died in the Titanic? Their bones and their fragments. They got eaten up by sharks. Look, God knows every single hair on your head. No doubt in my mind that he knows every single atom of your body. It's still floating around there somewhere. I don't know. I don't know how he's going to do it. He's going to assemble that thing together. What about the people in Hiroshima that got evaporated by a nuclear bomb? You know, no doubt. You look at that. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those were some of the two primary Christian places, actually. Interesting place to drop a nuke on. Think about that. Truman. Now, I'm going to drop a nuke on in one of the most Christian nation, Christian cities or whatever in Japan. So no doubt a lot of them Japanese people were saved. You think about it. They got obliterated. They got evaporated by a nuclear bomb. Well, it don't matter. God's going to assemble every single element, every single particle, and give them a new body. Okay? I believe that. No matter how you die, you get, you say, what about cremation and stuff? Look, you get cremated, you know, it's cheaper. Okay, God's going to, one day that urn, I was gonna, uh, sitting over here in the fireplace, whatever, that thing's going to bust open and get caught up to be with the Lord too. Okay? So regardless of how you bury or how you die, God, the dead in Christ are going to raise first. You know, obviously, can you imagine the environment? Can you imagine this? You're driving down, you know, Plum Creek Road. You look over Plum Creek Cemetery or whatever, and next thing you know, poof, but the grave's open. You know, you talk, talk dirt everywhere. You talk about, a, you know, a, an event. That's going to, that's gonna, uh, Hollywood don't got nothing on that. That's going to be the most scariest thing the world has ever seen. The dead in Christ rise first. All right, now uh, here's a brief thing on when, when does this event occur? All right, come to 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, you were just in 1 Thessalonians 4, so come to the next chapter. 1 Thessalonians 5. Number one, I can't give you the exact day or hour, but I can give you the times and seasons. Okay? Number one, we are, we are told to watch. We're told to watch for something. Okay? Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself. What, what, what I think we're to be watching for, really. But look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Okay? So, r right after verse 18, Paul's talking about this event, the rapture. Then look at verse 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren... You have no need that I write unto you. What do you mean, Paul? You don't need to, you don't need to write unto me? Well, wh why? Because look at verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Okay? For when they shall say, it's a different group of people, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Notice there's groups of people here. And when I'm reading the Bible, you always got to distinguish when Paul uses us, we, compared to them. There's a different group of people. We're told to be watching. We're told, we're not, and then you read the rest of it. Look at verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So we could expect some things. And Paul uses the analogy of a woman in birth. Hey, look, I can't give you the day and hour of, if, you know, we get, my wife gets pregnant or something and she has, a, uh, she has a child. I can't give you the exact day or hour, but I can tell the stages. She's pregnant for nine months, getting bigger and bigger. bigger. The baby's about to pop out at any time. Water's going to break and things. So you could have an idea, you know, look around you and things. Um, and you can have an idea when this event really is going to happen. Uh, now you think about it. When they say peace and safety... You know, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. This world's going to be in absolute chaos. You talk about a country, a, a worldwide locked, a, a shutdown, a global pandemic and things like that. Can you imagine if, you know, millions of people, they vanish in thin air? Who's going to, who's going to, who's going to work? What about all their jobs? You know, you talk about a, a, an economy collapsing. <laughs> and you look at, you know, you study economists to this day. And they'll tell you, they're, we're on the brink of collapsing. I watched some economists on YouTube and, you better watch out. I'm not a financial advisor or nothing like that, but they're saying you better watch out with your money in the bank. They could hit one button, and all of your assets, they're gone in a twink, you know, blink of an eye. That's why them people were jumping off bridge, bridges back in the, uh, what is it, the Great Depression and stuff, and stock market collapsed. They, 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 you know, things just shattered. So um, you, just, you just imagine the, the time where, you know, you think about it, people, planes crashing, 
car crashes, all this crazy stuff is going to happen when we get caught out of here. Now look at verse 5 there real quick. He says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Look at verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep. So what Paul's saying, let us not ever go to bed again. Let us just sit there and watch out in the sky. No, this is a different sleep. This is spiritual sleep. And that's sad to say. That's what, that's what the world around us in. They're sleeping. They're not aware. They're not looking. They're not watching. Let, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. For they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet of salvation. Now look at verse 9. This is going to get in the next point here. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye do. So that verse, verse 9, God hath not appointed us to wrath. Come to, come to a couple pages to the left. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. In other words, we don't got an appointment for God's wrath. Okay, this time period that's coming up, and we're going we're gonna to study some of these terms in the book of Revelation. You look at this time period, and it's called the wrath of God. Okay, now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. So this event happens before God pours out His wrath on earth. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Okay, I like even verse 9. This is a great one. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols. That's what we all had to do. Everybody has an idol set up in their heart. People think it's bound down to statues. There's a lot of idols out there. There's education. There's money. There's filthiness. People set up idols in their heart. And once we get saved, we're to turn away from those idols, okay? Turn away from the idols to serve the living and true God. All right, look at verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We're delivered from the wrath that's about to happen on planet Earth. We're not appointed to wrath. We don't got an appointment with it, okay? We're to wait for Jesus Christ to come back down from heaven, all right? Um, now, here's another one. Come to the book of Genesis. I'm going to just show you, some, uh, show you a particular character here in the Bible that foreshadows this event also. Look at Genesis chapter 5, the very beginning of your Bible. Genesis chapter 5, look at verse uh, 24. Genesis chapter 5, 24. I just want you to keep this in mind, though. You know, we're not appointed to wrath, and we're delivered from wrath, okay? Now, it's interesting. This is why I love the Bible, because it defines and interprets itself. So when I want to know something about wrath, and, you know, praise the Lord, we got computer systems nowadays. I can look up a term <laughs> and get the answer like that. You know, that's kind of lazy, though. We ought to be reading our Bibles and things. That's why, them, you know, you study them old-time saints, them old-time preachers. Man, they knew the Bible because they were reading it, reading it, reading it. So sometimes we have to have a balance on this technology. You know, no doubt it's quick. We could get knowledge like that on, you know, what is this, you know, wrath? And I look up in, in my Bible search system, you know, the wrath of God. And it, and it shoots me to you know, Revelation. You look at all these things in Revelation. So you could, you could start to understand, oh, okay, I'm not appointed to, the, to wrath because the Bible defines when and what this wrath is. Okay? Now look at this character here in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 5, I want verse number 22. Very interesting character in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 5, 22. Um, this is now, keeping it now, this is 3,600 B.C. 3,600 B.C. This is way back here at the time of Noah. Matter of fact, he was a little bit before Noah. A guy shows up, his name is Enoch. Okay, look at, look at uh, verse 22. And, okay, verse 21. Enoch lived sixty and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 
three hundred years and begot sons and daughters and begot sons and daughters. Now listen, the whole age limit of earth, these people lived to be nine hundred years old. You go, well, how in the world do you explain something like that? Well, number one, the environment was different. Something happened after the flood. When something happened in the atmosphere, you see the life the, the lifespans in the Bible, they go downhill. Now we're lucky if we're pushing up to eighty or ninety, you know? Back in the day they started out at nine hundred years old. Then after the flood, it started going from 200 to 150, 180 to 100. Next thing you know, David's writing, you know, we're lucky to hit uh, four score and 10. You know, days of a man are like in to 70 or 80. So things went downhill, okay? But before the flood, the atmosphere was different, okay? This is like, this is like your prehistoric times when you think of it. You watch all them Jurassic Park movies and mosquitoes are like ginormous and big spiders and these big, something was different with the atmosphere, they, uh, they aged a lot slower. You imagine you're around the world for 900 years, how wise you would be? You know, you'd be a smart guy. You were around that long. You think about it. Now look at verse 23. All the days of Enoch were 365 years. He was 365 years old. Well, that's interesting. We got that, that many days in the, uh, in the year. Uh, I don't know if there's no connection with that, but interesting. Look at verse 24. And Enoch walked with God... And he was not. He was not. He wasn't to be found. He was not. For God took him. For God took him. All right? Now, how do you, so how do you explain this? We'll come to the book of Hebrews. So, and I like what Paul writes in the book of Hebrews about this character, Enoch. Come to Hebrews chapter 11. I'll give you a page number. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 verse, uh, page 16, 12. Page 1612. Alright, this guy Enoch. He walked with God and he was not. For God took him. Enoch didn't die. It says, it says God took him. So literally Enoch was alive and was remaining at that present wicked world over here in the book of Genesis. And uh, literally God took him. Now Enoch is a picture of what we ought to be. Okay, before God pours out his wrath on planet earth, we ought to be walking with God. We ought to be talking with him. We ought to be, and I like what he said, look at Hebrews 11 verse 5. You know, you say, well, who's Enoch? Well, you look in the Bible, Enoch, and look, look, where, look where it points you to. Hebrews 11 verse 5. And I like this because this is the, another term that we can use for, you know, what happens at the rapture. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated. But that sounds a lot like how we're saved today. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Enoch was by faith. Enoch was translated. It's an interesting word. He was translated. So he went from one state, okay, and he was translated to another state. He went from, you know, being his corruptible body to his incorruptible body. He went from the present wicked world to being up there with God in glory. So, okay, look what happens here. Okay, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. Now look at this. For before his translation, he had this testimony. Now you want a good devotional nugget for the morning? This is the testimony that we ought to have. A testimony. People are watching you. People are looking at how you're living. Enoch walked with God. I want to be walking with God. Okay, Enoch had this testimony before he was caught up. Look what it says. He had this testimony that he pleased God. That's a blessing right there. I love that verse. He pleased God. Because you study the way that the world was back before God flooded it, it was absolutely vile and wicked. I mean, the worst. You, you imagine God getting so fed up with mankind, he pours out the fountains of the deep explode, water just pours down on this planet and drowns every single person in the world besides eight people. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Enoch had this testimony. He pleased God. Enoch was walking with God. That's what we ought to be doing during these times. Now, um, let, let's look at, look at another thing. Look at Jude. I think this is fascinating. Look at Jude. Look at Jude chapter 1. Look at Jude chapter 1. Now, I'll give you a page number. Page 1642. 1642. I'm going to show you more about this guy named Enoch. Okay? Now, Enoch is a guy, is a pitcher... Of he's sitting there, he's walking. Next thing you know, God catches him away before 
he pours out wrath on earth. Okay? So it's a, it's a perfect picture of a group of people that get caught up before God pours out wrath on earth. A fancy way of saying this in Bible study, they teach you and stuff, is it's called Bible typology. So Enoch typifies or pictures you know, a, a, a larger group of people that's going to happen. Sometimes that's hard to, hard to explain, but hopefully, hopefully you get that. There's characteristics in Enoch that, you could, that are similar to the characteristics of we which are alive and remain. Uh, look at Jude here. Jude chapter 1. There's only one thing in Jude. Look at this. Jude 1, 14. 16.42. Look at verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, now what we're about to read here is the oldest segment of a preserved sermon that, that was ever existed. This is, the, this is what Enoch was preaching. You want to talk about a preacher. Enoch was preaching this. Look what he says. Prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Enoch is preaching a message of the second coming. Now, thank God, we got more revelation. God revealed a lot more than what just Enoch had. And the Apostle John wrote about in Revelation chapter 19, the heavens open and he that he's come back on a white horse and who's following him? The armies of heaven. That's us. That's those who are saved coming back on white horses. <laughs> Literally, ten thousands of his saints. Enoch is preaching a second coming message. It's amazing. Now look at verse 15. Don't end there. Look at, look at this. You tell me if Enoch was one of them positive prosperity, tells you everything you want to hear type of preacher. I just want to tickle your ears. and I just want to tell you how beautiful the world is and how great everything's going to be. Look at, look at Enoch's message, verse 15. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among all them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches with ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Enoch was preaching against sin and he's preaching judgment. And nowadays you look at, you look at Christianity nowadays, they don't want nothing to do with judgment. They say, ah, you know, don't, don't judge me. Don't, you know, don't judge lest you be judged. No. We're told to judge. And, that, and you say, well, how do you judge? You judge things by God's book. It ain't my opinion. Forget about it. You judge things by God's book. We're told to judge. We're commanded to judge righteously. Not be all, you know, hypocritical. And we're told to judge. If, it doesn't, if something doesn't line up with God's word, you've got to discern between truth and error. Okay? Enoch, man, he's preaching a hard sermon against a bunch of ungodly people. Okay? Um, now, uh, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Look at Genesis chapter 6 again real quick. Genesis chapter 6. A little bit about when does this event occur. Look at Genesis chapter 6. Go back to it. So Enoch, okay, Enoch is, is, a, is, a, is preaching against sin. He's preaching judgment. Now look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. This is, uh, we're getting about to the time where uh, Noah's flood is, okay? And this is where you get the expression, you know, ah, oh, he missed the boat, you know. You ever hear that expression, he missed the boat? Well, yeah, this, they, get this from, they get this from Genesis 6. I don't know how, what the population was back in the day, but they literally missed the boat. And listen, Noah and his sons and his family, they were building this ark for 120 years. And Jesus Christ said, uh, in, or elsewhere in the Bible says, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching the message. You better watch out, the rain's coming. He was preaching the message Judgment is about to get poured out on planet Earth here. You had to either get right with God, you come in with me, or not. How many people ended up getting saved? Noah, a good, one of the greatest preachers that ever walked this Earth. Eight people. That's a little comfort, you know, but we're, we're small in numbers, you know. Well, you look at it at the end of the day, how many people was, was saved after Noah's preaching the same message for 120 years? Eight people. I mean, that ought, that ought to tell you something, you know. Um, so look, look at the state, though. Look at Genesis 6, verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I could turn on Channel 5 News, Channel 6 News and get the same exact thing what he just said right there. You look around all this wickedness. You know, mothers and kids killing their babies and shootings and, you know, kids just committing suicide and plagues and Russia bombing these people and biological warfare and Things are getting wicked and wicked, man. The world's collapsing. It's on the verge of collapse. And you, you, can you imagine that? 
Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So God ended up flooding the planet, ended up pouring out judgment. Now to, to get something, notice that one guy that was spared from judgment. Well, that one guy pictures a group of people that are spared from judgment. All right, look at, um, look at uh, let's see here. Look at John chapter 10 real quick. Got a couple, couple more things here. We're going to have to wrap it up. Give me like 15 more minutes here. Look at John chapter 10, the Gospel of John. I'm going to just show, show you some things about when does this event occur and why we're not, um, we're not appointed to wrath. Let's look, just look at this here. Look at John chapter 10. Look at verse uh, 11. This is page 1404. Page 1404. Page 1404. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. Look at verse, uh, verse 11. And I said this before, but I want you guys all to see this verse. Be familiar with it. Look at John 10, 11. This is Jesus Christ talking. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. And we studied on Thursday night. There's a guy that's coming in the future called the idle shepherd. And he's a... Uh, what was it? He, um, he, was a, he was a fake shepherd. He's a false shepherd. And that's the Antichrist. Jesus is the good shepherd. He laid down his life for the sheep. That's us. Okay? Now listen, you think about this. Why would the good shepherd allow his sheep to go through a time of absolute hell on earth? He's the good shepherd. What's a good shepherd do when he sees a storm coming with his sheep? He gathers them together, he herds them up, and he brings them into his barn. <laughs> you know, it's a cool picture. He brings all these sheep. He gets them all together. Not he won't leave one stra stranded. And he goes on, you know. And a bad guy, he or a bad a bad shepherd, he'd say, "I forget about that sheep. I got the majority." A good shepherd collects all his sheep and he brings them into his barn before the storm gets pulled out. That's exactly what God, Jesus Christ, is going to do with us. He's going to gather his sheep and catch us out of here while he literally while the storm hell on earth gets unfolded. Okay, look at um, look at Revelation six. Just want to give you a couple verses on um, Revelation chapter six, because I'm going to I'm going to show you what this what this uh, what this time period is also called um, over here. It's called the time of the Lamb's wrath. The time of the Lamb's wrath, the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb. This is interesting. You know, we know who the Lamb is. That's Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world and all that. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse number 16. Now look at this. Let's back it up here in verse 15. We're going to close here. I've got 10 minutes. I'm going to give you a crash course on the book of Revelation. <laughs> okay? And this is one of the greatest, greatest books. Like I said, the book of Revelation is actually very easy to understand. It is. It's pretty plain and straightforward. It's plain, it's cut out, but it's hard to believe. Because you see these big hailstones, 70-pound 70, 70 hailstones coming down, plumbing in earth. You see these, these mutant hybrid creatures coming up out of planet earth. You, you, you think this is something from a sci-fi movie. It's not. It's from the Bible. You know, it's amazing. You know, it's not hard to understand. It means what it says and says what it means. Sometimes it's hard to believe, man. I can't imagine these things happening. But that's it, man. This is, this is some wild stuff. Look at Revelation 6. Look at verse number for context. Look at verse 14. Revelation 6, 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. This gets in your whole thing. I'm prepping for doomsday. I'm prepping for, the, you know, I'm going to get into my underground bunker and look at Bill Gates. He got that thing miles long and, you know, he's got these, they got these, these um, Armageddon bunkers and stuff. People are going to be doing this during that time of the tribulation period. Now look, look, look what these people are saying there, verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. 
hide ourselves. They're best off. They're sitting in these bunkers and they're saying, oh my, oh, they're going to say, you know, that expression, oh my God. They're going to understand, oh my God, he's coming. <laughs> he's coming back. Right? Just, it's best off of the rocks falling us. It's best off of the mountains just consume us. We don't even want to look at his face. That's how wicked, that's the state of them. They don't want to see God. And it says, John says in Revelation chapter 1, they're going to look on whom they pierced. We see Jesus Christ come back on a, on a nice white horse, big hole still in his hands, many crowns on his head, white as can be, but eyes flame as fire. He's coming back with vengeance. He's coming back uh, with wrath. We've got to understand that. We've got to know. Many people aren't familiar with this Jesus. They're going to think that's the devil coming back. That's the, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to fall for the devil on, on, uh, on, on the planet because the devil is telling you all kinds of smooth things and he's seductive and, and you know, he's, he's tricking you and giving you peace, trying to say there's peace when really there ain't no peace. He's out there to deceive you. Next thing you know, the Lord comes back. And look what he says in verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Nobody going to be able to stand unless if you're saved. <laughs> You ain't going to be able to stand the wrath of God. Now, notice what it's called, though, in the previous verse. From the wrath of the Lamb. Okay? So it would make sense that the Lamb ain't pouring His wrath out on His sheep. I mean, come on. The, the sheep are gone. We're gone. Okay? That's, you gotta, and I got, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, look at, look at Revelation chapter 11. Just to show you some of these things about the wrath of God. Look at, look at Revelation eleven eighteen. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in time of the dead, that they should be judged. And thou shouldest give rewards unto thy servants and prophets, and to the saints, to them that fear thy name. Um, small and great, that shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Now here, i got to explain this real quick. We talk about this, okay? Look, if people miss the rapture, if they miss the boat, they don't get caught up at this time period that's going to happen, then you better start warning them of what's to come. You better start warning them, look, the devil's going to show up on this world. You're going to see some wild and crazy things you think from a sci-fi movie. You're going to see some crazy things. You're going to see the mark of the beast show up. Don't you dare take that mark of the beast because one day I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be, I'm going to be up in the clouds. You ain't going to see me no more. You better look out for these things because, listen, there's, even during through this time period over here, seven years it is, it's seven years, people still end up getting right. They say, no, we don't want nothing to do with that devil. We don't want nothing to do with the mark of the beast. So what do they do? They lay down their necks on the chopping blocks. They get decapitated. They get their heads cut off for the, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there will be people in the tribulation period that are saved, that get saved, okay? That's not like all, all hope is lost for them, actually. So there is a group of people the Jews and Gentiles that go through this time period. Not the church, not us, not the sheep. We're gone, okay? Um, now, because it's interesting to note, when you read the book of Revelation from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 19, you don't find those inclusive words like we and us and ye and brethren. You don't find those words. That whole group of, that whole group of people is gone. They're out the picture, okay? It's just something just to get. Um, all right, look at another one. Look at Revelation 12. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 12. Look at this. Look at Revelation 12, 12. Revelation 12, 12. Now this is, now this is something. Um, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Look at this. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So this gets into the whole thing of, you know, you see the movie Star Wars and stuff like that. Well, literally, this is the, in Revelation chapter 12, there's a war in the midst of heaven. Okay? And Michael the archangel cast down Satan down to planet Earth. Okay? And he has great wrath because he has three and a half years, well, seven years, to wreck as much havoc as he possibly can. Okay? He had the short time. So the devil's pouring out his wrath. Look at Revelation uh, four, look at 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Look at verse number 8. Look at 
Revelation 14, 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All right, we're going to study that mystery. That's on that, one of that, on that handout. That's the last mystery we're going to be studying. That city, that particular group of, it's a religion, it's a city. But there's wrath, uh, there's wrath there. Now, I, I'm going to close it up here because I got four more, five more verses. Come to Revelation 19. I think this would be a good place to, good place to end it here. Um, yeah, I got like four more, verses, four more verses about the wrath of God being poured out. And how we're not, remember what Paul said? You're not appointed under wrath. We're to wait from Jesus Christ that comes down from heaven who delivered us from the wrath to come. We're delivered from it. We're not appointed to it. It's the wrath of the Lamb. He's not pouring out His wrath on His sheep. We've got to get that. Now check this out, Revelation 19. Look at verse number 11. Okay, Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened... And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame as fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Capital W. The Word of God. Remember when we studied the, the mystery of godliness? God was manifested in the flesh? Well, John chapter 1 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. So there's the capital W, Word. That's, this is Jesus Christ. I'll keep reading. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. You know, goeth a sharp sword. And you read the Bible, the, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like he's just speaking things. You know, it's, it's like the word is like, it's like a sword. What he speaks is like a sword. His mouth goeth, uh, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Look what he does. And with it he should smite the nations. And he shall roll them with a rod of iron. Now remember the first coming? Jesus Christ was stricken and smitten. They, they put a crown of thorns around his head. They put, they put a little wooden stick in his hand and was mocking him. Put a purple robe on him and, was, and the Roman soldiers were hitting him over the head with, the, with his rod. The king of the Jews, king of the Jews, mocking him and laughing at him. Now look how he comes back here. <laughs> Who has the last laugh when you think of it? You, you want to mock me? You want to put a crown of thorns on me the first time? Wait till you see me when I come back. I'm going to be rolling the nations with a rod of iron. Like I say, this is a military dictatorship rolled by a sinless, perfect God, rolled by Jesus Christ. Look at verse uh, 15, rest of it. And with it he should smite the nations, he shall roll them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture... And on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Imagine that. And you know that verse, he says he's treading the wine press. You know a thing or two about making wine over there in Italy and stuff? They step on the wines back, you know, barefoot. They're squishing the grapes. You read Isaiah chapter 63. That's why I like his picture. The Lord comes back, he's trampling people. You say, oh my, oh my God, I never, heard, I never heard of this Jesus before. That's why you got to read the Bible, man. You'd be shocked. How many people? They, he's coming back. He's trampling over the enemies. He's destroying all the enemies that were against him. Satan, all the nations that teamed up with the devil for those seven years. He says, you get out of here. Forget you. You go down in the pit of hell. I'm setting up my kingdom for 1,000 years. And like I said, he rolls and reigns the nations with a rod of iron. It ain't no more, you know, the Jesus of the first coming. You know, like, like it's the whole thing is he came as a lamb the first time. A lamb to the slaughter to die for our sins. God had to come down and do all that for us. He's coming the second time as a lion from the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ is like an unto a lion. It's a big difference from a lamb and a lion. And Jesus Christ fulfills both of those roles. Come back as a lamb the first time. I laid down my life for you to get saved. 
come back the second time like a lion. He's out there destroying. He's out there devouring his enemies and stuff. You know what that's called? That's called righteous judgment. You say, why in the world is God doing that? He's, he's a, it's called righteous judgment. God gave them time after time after time to get right. And you read the book of Revelation, uh, God's, God's pointing out all these signs. I'm almost done. I'm sorry. I'm almost done. God's given all these signs. He's dropping these hailstones. He's making these beasts come up from the bottomless pit. You know what the purpose of it is? To wake people up to get right. You know what the Bible says in Revelation? Neither they repented of their ungodly deeds. Neither they repented of their sorceries, their fornications, their murders, their, thie their thieving. They didn't get right. God gave them time after time after time to get right. Just like he did in the days of Noah. He gave them 120 years building that boat. You better get right. And the Lord even said in the previous chapter, for men's days shall be 120 years. So you better get right. Now this time, seven years, then people don't get right. They're rebellious. They're stubborn. They don't want nothing to do with God. So what's he do? He destroys them and sets up his kingdom for 1,000 years. All right, I think that's enough. I think I spoke enough this morning. I'm gonna, you guys could chew on that for a week. And um, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, the order of it. So we talked about the groups of people, the dead in Christ, those that are saved. Um, I, did leave, I did leave one, one group out, which is, which is a shame, is the children. We, uh, that's another question. What about all the babies? What about all the, the innocents? I believe God's going to take them. There's a couple of verses we'll maybe pick up from there from next week. Okay, so um, let's just bow our heads for closing prayers. And if you guys would, let's turn on them speakers. I just want to sing one song here and we'll be through. <clears throat> Now, this is bow our heads for closing prayer real quick. <clears throat> All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I do pray, Lord, that um, if there be anybody in here that is unsaved or anybody watching over the, uh, over the air or anybody who watches this, Lord, if they're unsaved, Lord, I pray that they get right. I pray that they repent, Lord, and that they, that they turn their hearts and that they change their minds, Lord, to, um, to get saved. I pray, Lord, that they understand that you died for them on the cross, you shed your blood for them, you was buried, and you resurrected the third day, Lord, for their salvation, Lord. I pray right now that they receive the free gift of salvation. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could do it while you're driving down the road. You can do it sitting in the pew. You could get saved anywhere, any place, any time, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they call upon you and that they, that they tell you in their heart, Lord, and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that I fell short of heaven. And if I, Lord, and I understand that I deserve hell, and I and, and pray in your heart that, um, that Lord, I understand that you died for sinners, that you died for me, and right now, Lord, I do receive you as my Lord and Savior, and I receive the gospel, and what you've done for me. I pray, Lord, that you that, that anybody here would, would pray that, would believe it with all their heart. Anybody who's listening, I pray, Lord, that they, that you get them saved, so that. So that they don't have to go through this time of hell that's coming up here on earth, Lord. Um, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you, Lord, for um, opening up the scriptures to us this morning. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing page 500 in the red hymnal. Page 500 and we'll be done. Page 500. I like this song. It says, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Obviously, you probably tell a Southerner wrote this book, you know, out there over there yonder. <laughs> so, but when the roll is called up yonder, it's a good, good, song about the, uh, good song about the rapture. Page 500, that's verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. Let's all sing them. Bright and cloud this morning when the dead and 
Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is fall up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll Labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. When the sad life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll. Thank you guys for hanging in there with me. Went a little bit overboard, but um, Julie, if you want to yeah, you can cut that. <clears throat>